Welcome to Maple Avenue Christian Church, a great place to connect, grow, serve, and share. We hope that through today's service, you will connect with God and build community with Christ followers. Please use the online form to let us know how we can pray for you this week. If you are worshiping in person, you can fill out a connection card located at the back. To help us stay better connected, subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Facebook. Don't forget to turn on notifications so you don't miss a thing. To be added to our email updates or if you're having trouble receiving our email, please contact the church office. Before we get started, please take a moment to silence your phone. Here's what's going on at MECC. Sermon questions for small group or personal reflection are now available on our website or at the back of the worship center. If you're new here, we'd like to invite you to our next Discover MACC dinner. Together, we'll enjoy a short meal and a discussion about who we are at Maple Avenue Christian Church. Please prayerfully consider what your family can give to the meal pack for Mirosh Rock and Friends of Christ in Haiti. You can give online or with your giving envelope. Also consider taking part in the meal pack on Saturday, October 16th. Sign up for a shift at mapleavenue.org. Thank you for worshiping with us today. Be sure to check us out online to stay updated throughout the week. But for now, can't say we didn't tell ya. Will you please stand this morning? I'm going to read Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 3. The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me, because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from the darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. Jesus is the anointed one. Amen. He's the one that was prophesied about, and Jesus even said this about himself in the New Testament. So let's praise him for fulfilling the will of his Father. He provided salvation and freedom from sin for those, for all those who would accept him as their Lord and Savior. So let's give him our praise this morning.
welcome you here, Lord Jesus. Because when we see you, we find strength to face the day. And in your presence, all our fears are washed away. Because when we see you, we find strength to face the day. And in your presence, all our fears are washed away. They're washed away.
Well, welcome to Maple Avenue. We're glad you're here to worship with us this morning, whether you're joining us online or you're here in person. We're just glad you're here to worship Jesus with us. And uh, uh, this morning, we're beginning a new sermon series. It's entitled Living Out the Gospel. Now, all the stuff that we've talked about as we've been going through this book of Galatians is all great and good and stuff, until, but it does us no good unless we start to live it out. So Paul is wrapping up this entire book with chapters 5 and 6, and he talks about the importance of us living out the gospel. So that's what we're going to look at the next four weeks. So those of you who have enjoyed our study through Galatians, we still have four weeks left. Those of you who are like, I am so glad when we get done with Galatians, we only have four weeks left, so both of you ought to be happy. Um, but Paul lays out these great implications with all the stuff that's going on, and uh, so that's what we're going to look at over the next couple of weeks. So uh, if you would, I want to pray with us as we get into our study this morning. Father, we want to come to you and we thank you, first of all, for Jesus, the living word, the one who makes the words on the pages of this thing we call the Bible come to life. The one whose spirit lives in and through them. And we thank you that we can come together in this place today, that we can worship. And I pray, Father, that we would honor you with our worship. I pray that we're faithful to what the word of God says. I pray that we not uh, read into it, but that we read it and we allow the spirit to teach us what is actually being said. So be with us and guard us, Father, and protect us as we study your word. Allow it to change our lives so that we become the men and women you desire us to be as we walk in Christ. It's in the name of Jesus, our Savior, we pray. Amen. Well, I don't know if y'all have noticed or not, but fall's kind of sneaking into the air. People are spending time at pumpkin patches, and the smell of apple cider is just rolling through the air, and I love that. And in West Central Illinois, it's one of those times where we start thinking about, okay, it's raining all the time, it's starting to get chilly, so what do we do? We come inside. And if you're like me, you maybe throw on a good movie or a football game. Yesterday was a great day for football. Somebody walked in, Janice Gates walked in this morning and said, I thought you'd have your UK shirt on. Well, let me let you in on a little secret. Kentucky beat number 10 Florida yesterday, just a little bit happy in football. So anyway, but football's in the air. Movies are all around us and all that kind of stuff. And uh, I wanted to start this morning by asking you a question. What is your favorite movie? Just shout it out. Just throw something at me. Planes, Trains, and Automobiles. <laughs> That's a good one. Anybody else? Favorite movie? The Wizard of Oz? All right, there you go. I'll be home for Christmas. All right. Secondhand Lion. Huh? Titanic. All right. Good ones, good ones. Hoosiers. All right, well, I like Hoosiers, Indiana. Well, I'm glad to see you guys have movies that you like. I want to share with you one of my favorite movies. I absolutely uh, love this movie. Every year when I was in college, I would have about eight or nine guys come into my dorm room. Now, those of you who have gone to college and you have a dorm room, you know how small those things are, all right? So there's eight or nine of us piled into this room, and every year, beginning of the semester, what we would do is we would watch the movie Braveheart. Nine guys packed in a room. It's one of my favorite movies. I absolutely love it. It stars Mel Gibson. He plays the legendary William Wallace. And, uh, and uh, we would just spend time watching that. And if you don't know this movie, if you've never heard of it, because maybe you've lived under a rock or something, then I want to fill you in real quick. So the movie Braveheart is about William Wallace. He's a Scottish rebel. And he leads this uprising against this cruel English leader, Edward the Longshanks, or Edward I, who wishes to inherit the crown of Scotland for himself. And so when, when Wallace was a young boy, his father and his brother, along with many others, they lost their lives in this battle trying to free Scotland. Once he loses another one of his loved ones, Wallace begins his long quest to make Scotland free once and for all 
along with the assistance of Robert the Bruce. Well, in this movie, before Wallace leads his men into battle, he makes a speech about them pursuing freedom. And his men get all fired up, and they charge into battle against England. I won't tell you the rest of it, but uh, it's very inspiring. That section is very inspiring. If you can just picture in your mind's eye the passion and the zeal that the Apostle Paul had as he is writing his, this letter to these churches in this region of Galatia who have been hijacked by these false teachers, we hear Paul telling them pretty much the same kind of thing. Pursue the freedom. Don't let people take it from you. Don't let these false teachers take the freedom you have in Christ away from you. And so Paul is encouraging the churches in Galatia to hang on to their freedom in Christ. And then he tells them how to hang on to their freedom in Christ. So if you have your Bibles this morning, I want to invite you to turn to Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. Galatians 5, verse 1. We're just going to read that. And I'm going to talk about it. We're going to go through this a little bit of uh, just in sections. So I'm not going to have you stand this morning. But Galatians 5, verse 1 says this, if you're there. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Here the Apostle Paul is saying freedom in Christ begins by being yoked with Christ. Freedom in Christ begins by being yoked with Christ. The freedom Paul's talking about here is a personal freedom in our relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. You see, Paul isn't discussing civil liberties. He's not discussing a mortal enemy who's trying to alter our way of living. Paul is talking about the enemy and those who do his bidding. He's talking about the guilt that Satan tries so hard to lay on Christians who have experienced freedom in Christ. God has given us the freedom from guilt, of trying to live according uh, perfectly to the law, of trying to live up to the expectations of, of other self-righteous Christians. We don't have to do that. He has given us freedom from the power of sin in our lives uh, and freedom from what God, uh, to become what God has created us to be. Our freedom is a wonderful, life-altering thing. And if you don't know that freedom that comes in Christ, my hope and my prayer is that before you leave today that you will really understand and know the freedom that we have in Christ. It's not a burden to be in a relationship with Jesus. It really is a freedom. And no matter what you go through in life, having that relationship with Christ as the solid rock in which you stand will help keep you uh, grounded in him because life's going to throw all kinds of things at you and the reason for this is because Paul warns us not to become yoked with the slavery of of the false teachers but to remain yoked to Christ a yoke I brought one in this morning a yoke is a piece of wood that allows two animals to be harnessed together and when those animals are harnessed together in this yoke, they can do amazing things. Now, what Christ calls us to be is yoked to him. And what many of us try to do is to be yoked to the world or yoked to ourselves. Now, if I stuck my head through here, you want me to stick my head in here? I'll do it. I can't hardly get it in there. Anyway. I did this morning. I don't know what happened. My head's full since this morning. But anyway, if you can stick your head through here, then all you've got is, and, and you're just by yourself. And so you have to have someone come along or else the yoke itself will just weigh you down. That's what the law does to people. They get yoked to the law, and it's just a one-sided thing. And so all you're doing is dragging around the law. And what Christ invites us to do, and we'll talk about this, is he comes alongside, he's got the yoke on, he says, be yoked with me. I'll make your burden light. I'll make it a lot easier to go through life if you're yoked with him. 
So one of the questions I want to just ask you is, who are you yoked with? Who are you yoked with? Are you yoked against, are you yoked with the world? Are you yoked with Christ? That's the big question that we all have to answer. So that yoke allows those animals to share the load, to pull together, and that's exactly what Christ wants to do with us. He wants to share the load. He wants us to pull along with him. In this Bible, in the Bible that we read, the yoke is sometimes referenced metaphorically to describe a weight. It's a task. It's an obligation. For example, King Rehoboam tried to instill respect for himself by threatening his subjects with a heavy yoke. You've probably met people like that. They try and make fear the driving force, and sometimes people are yoked by fear. Breaking a yoke often symbolizes freedom from oppressors. If you've got your Bibles, flip over to Isaiah 10, 27. Just read that. In that day, their burden will be lifted from your shoulders, their yoke from your neck. The yoke will be broken because you have grown so fat. It can also mean the beginning of a new phase in life as when Elisha, Remember when Elisha left the farm life to follow Elijah? Elijah came up to him and put his cloak on him. And Elisha left immediately. He went and he slaughtered the two oxen. And he burned them with the yoke he was using to plow them with. And he fed his people. And they celebrated. And he goes and he follows Elijah. People in Jesus' day, they really, they really understood what a yoke was. They knew that Jesus, uh, what Jesus meant when he said, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart. And you're going to find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. See, Jesus isn't speaking here of physical burdens necessarily. He was talking about the heavy burden of the system, of the works of the Pharisees that they laid on the backs of the people. What he was doing was inviting them to take to himself so that he could be their rest. Where do you find your rest in life? What is it that replenishes you? What is it that causes you to be able to center down and calm yourself? A lot of people, they turn to to a lot of substances. Some people turn to alcohol, others to drugs. Some to other addictions like pornography, some to gossip, some people turn to food. What is it that you turn to? I want to encourage you to turn to Christ. Let him be the source that that gets you through the tough times of life. Let him be your source for living, for anything and everything that you do. And that's what Jesus was inviting these people to do. That's what Jesus invites us to today. Jesus rebukes the Pharisees for laying heavy burdens on the shoulders of the people. Here's how he rebuked them in Matthew 23, 4. He said, they tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders. But they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to move them. See, the yoke of the Pharisees is the burdensome yoke of self-righteous and legalistic law-keeping. That's what the yoke of the Pharisees are. That's what the churches in Galatia were battling. That's what the people of Jesus' day were battling. Bible scholars have estimated that the Pharisees added over 600 regulations regarding what is qualified as working on the Sabbath. That's just 600 regulations to one commandment. Could you handle that? I mean, you'd be living in fear. Oh, what if I do this wrong? What if I do that wrong? You know, it's, it, and, and listen, folks, some of that stuff is carried on into today. I have people ask me, what should I wear to church? Clothes. That, that's the only thing we ask. Just wear clothes. You know, cover yourself and come to church. Because the reality is, we don't all have nice suits. Some people can't afford them. That's a burden for some people. That's a huge burden. And you know what you do? You're keeping people away. I mean, that, that's a real one. That's, that's something that I've, I've had lots of people ask me, what do we have to wear? Clothes. That's just wear something that covers yourself. It's just an example of all these different kinds of things that people put on people. Jesus taught the crowds, and, and Paul's reminding the Christians in Galatia that any kind of law-keeping is burdensome and amounts to a heavy yoke. Okay? 
It, it's oppressive because no amount of law keeping can bridge the gap between our sinfulness and God's holiness. Can you keep enough laws to bridge that gap between you and God? No, you can't. I'll answer it for you. Though some people, they try. That's all they try to do is, is live out these laws, to live these certain rules. God spoke through the prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 64, 6. He said, all of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. I don't have to tell you what he's talking about. We need to understand just how disgusted God truly is when we try and have a, a connection with him through our own efforts. And when we try to make ourselves right with him by keeping laws, by keeping rules, by following regulations, God's disgusted by that. Because when he looks upon us, he sees us trying to do it all ourselves. And what we're doing is saying, God, listen, this is what we're doing. God, I'm good enough that I don't need the sacrifice of Jesus. It's what we're doing. When we revert back to trying to, do, to be a law keeper, what the Galatians were doing, they were trying to revert back to being law keepers, and their specific thing they were arguing about or discussing was circumcision because the Jews thought that's what made you right with God. That was the sign. That was the seal. No. It's a relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. But when we try and make those laws, we're saying, God, I don't need your sacrifice. I don't need the sacrifice of your one and only son. I got this. I can do it all by myself. Let me just ask. You don't have to raise your hands. But has anybody in here ever struggled with that, even just a little bit? I'm sure we have. I have. There have been times. Oh, i got to keep this, this, and this. i got to make sure I'm doing this, this, and this. What is this person going to think? What's that person going to think? Quite frankly, it doesn't matter. What matters is what an audience of one thinks. That's who we live for, he, that's who, and he died for us so that we could live for him. You see, the yoke of Jesus is light, and the yoke of Jesus is easy to carry because it's the yoke of repentance and faith, and it's allowed by a singular commitment to follow him. The Apostle John in 1 John 5, 3 said, in fact, this is love for God. You know what it is? To keep his commands. And his commands are not burdensome. Look it up. That's 1 John 5, 3. In fact, this is love for God, to keep his commands. And his commands are not burdensome. This freedom in Christ is the realization that we are loved even though there is nothing in us. There is nothing in us that deserves God's love. We are set free from the condemnation of the law because Jesus has already paid our penalty. When you break a law, you're fined. Jesus paid your fine. No more looking over your shoulder. No more beating yourself up over failures. No more leaving church feeling like we have more to do than we did when we came in. Think about it like this. <clears throat> most every night, I won't say every night, but most every night, my wife Kelly and I take our dog Max out for a walk. He's on his leash because people are scared of German shepherds. So he's on his leash. And he walks by us the whole way. And I can, for the most part, kind of control his actions while he's on the leash, and there's no problems at all except he about dislocates my arm when he smells something over in the grass and I'm going one way and he pulls me another. But by and large, I can kind of control his actions. However, as we get done with our walk and we're coming home and we're getting on our property, I let him off the leash and he can run home the last little bit and he's running free because I can't keep up with him. And he goes home about 99% of the time. 
he'll obey. But he's really enjoying himself. He's off his leash, especially if we're playing fetch, but he's free to run. He's simply enjoying life with the freedom that he's been given, that's been given to him. You see, that's the picture of what the believer is supposed to look like. As believers in Christ, who have been set free, who are no longer yoked to a law, but yoked in Christ, as believers like that, we're free. And that freedom has a look to it. We should be the most joyful people anyone encounters. We really should. But let me ask you, let me ask you a real question. Would you want your first impression of Jesus to be you? Would you want your first impression of Jesus to be you? Would you want someone else's first impression to be you? Are you that person who has joy? That, that, that's the way we should be. We should be enthusiastic people. We should be people people want to be around, not people feel like they have to be around. Well, I better go over here and say something to old Bruce, or he might be. No, I should want to go over and say, Bruce, I'm glad to see you this morning. And I am. Or this Bruce, Bruce, I'm glad to see you this morning. Shouldn't matter. That's the kind of people we should be. Because Jesus has set us free. Now, we don't live recklessly. I'm not promoting that. We just live as those who have had their leash, if you will, the bony finger of the law removed. And unfortunately, this liberating freedom is often absent in the church. The church is sadly filled with people who are burdened with guilt made to feel that they are miserable failures. You ever been in a church like that? You ever been around a group of Christians who treat you like that? You're a miserable failure. You need to do just a little bit more. See, this is a perversion of the gospel. That's being yoked to slavery, not Christ. And Paul wants the Christians in Galatia to be yoked to Christ. So let's move on. Look with me at Galatians 5, 2 through 12. If you have your Bibles, keep your finger there. We'll go there. Paul says this. He says, Mark my words. I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to, to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. Did you hear that? Neither one has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. You were running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. And then he goes to this. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. I am confident in the Lord that you will take no other view the one who is throwing you into confusion, whoever that may be, will have to pay the penalty. Brothers and sisters, if I'm still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. As for those agitators, I wish they'd go the whole way and emasculate themselves. Paul's pretty harsh right there. He's kind of fired up about things. What he's saying is this. Paul is saying, 
freedom in Christ is maintained by guarding against yeast. That's to say that if you think you have to be circumcised or any other requirement. Now, the circumcision was to the people of his day. But for people today, there are all kinds of other requirements. But people, so, so he's saying if you think you have to be circumcised or any other requirement before you can be saved or made right with God, then you don't understand the gospel. If you think there's something you have to do to be saved through the blood of Jesus, then you don't understand the gospel. If you feel that there's something you have to do to gain salvation, then Paul says Christ is of no benefit to you. That's what he's telling them. The circumcision, the uncircumcision is of no value. In fact, if you feel you have to obey one of the laws before you can be made right with God, you're putting yourself back under all of the laws. Now, we don't live under the laws. I mean, we just don't. I mean, the Ten Commandments, yes. Those are our laws. We live under those. I'm not ta- but he's talking about all these different laws that, that the, uh, the Pharisees were placing on people or that church fathers have placed on people. It's guilt. To manipulate people to see things just see things just one way, and if you're doing that, you're once again following uh, the, the the faith where you have to earn your own way. The reason for this is that when we make salvation contingent on what we do, we trust ourselves rather than Christ. For salvation. Please don't raise your hand, but just ask yourself this question Who do I trust with my salvation? Do I put more trust in me, or do I completely put my trust in Christ for my salvation? Where's your trust? Is it in yourself and what you do, or is it in Christ in what He has done? what he has accomplished. Remember, he himself said, it is finished, which means nothing else needs to be done. Nothing else can be added. Nothing. He has done what needed to be done when he died on the cross to make us right with him. Now, listen, this is not blanket universal salvation. I'm not saying that. I'm talking to people who are Christ followers. I'm talking to people who have said... I surrender my life to Jesus and I will live for him. I will obey his commands because his commands are not burdensome. And so I live according to his teachings, his way. And I don't fall back into the ways of the world. But I'm also not going to place a yoke on other people. We can't do that. That's what the Pharisees were doing. That's what these false teachers were doing when they came into Galatia. They were trying to place a burden on people. They were trying to place a yoke that nobody could could carry. And so specifically, this is why Paul goes into this discourse on circumcision. It's not an issue today. I understand that. But let me talk about it because it was an issue in Paul's day. And maybe there are things that you can see in your own life, that you've heard in your own experiences, that you can go, oh, that was their circumcision. So Paul goes into this discourse on circumcision. It's, It's not that circumcision as an act is bad. Okay, he's not saying that. Because it's not. One of Paul's companions who was Jewish was circumcised. But he also had another companion who was Greek and not Jewish and he was not circumcised. It's that circumcision as a requirement for salvation is wrong. It's just wrong. He says if the people give in to this requirement in order to be saved... They've abandoned the liberating truth of the gospel. I believe too many Christians live uh, under a yoke that's not with Christ. We just do. It, It may not be circumcision, but it's something. Yet much of the church, churches have requirements that must be met in order to receive the grace of God, salvation through him. I'm not intending to step on toes this morning. I'm just trying to make some things very clear. But for a lot of people today, their circumcision is is baptism. So let me speak very carefully. I believe that the Bible teaches that every Christian 
needs to be baptized. Y'all agree with that? Okay, amen. They, they, every Christian, when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you need to be baptized. And I would say need. Okay? But just to be clear, there's nothing magical in the waters of baptism. The act of baptism, okay, does not save one single solitary person. There are a lot of soggy sinners who are going to be surprised on Judgment Day. Until you have that real encounter that happens in your heart, until you realize that there's nothing in you that can make you right with God, and the only way to be made right with God is to accept the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ, as the only way to salvation, then you're kidding yourself. You're living under that yoke. Jesus himself said in John 14, 6, you know what he said. He said, I, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. And then he follows that up with this. No one, no one comes to the Father except through church attendance on Sunday morning. No, through baptism. No, through communion. No, through devotions. No, no one comes to the Father except through me, not me, him except through Jesus Christ. Do you have that kind of trust in him? That's where our trust, that's where our faith, that's where our hope must be. This is the same kind of yoke. This is the same kind of yeast that Jesus spoke of in Matthew 16, 6. When he said, be careful, Jesus said to him, be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. This yeast is used as a metaphor for growth, for either good or evil. However, both Greeks and Jews use the idea of yeast as a symbol for corruption. And unfortunately, I think we've all seen when we as men uh, try and put a yoke upon people, even in our churches, we can see that corruption can happen. The yeast of the Pharisees was the subtle influence the Pharisees exerted over people. Those who followed the Pharisees might demand signs, but they would gradually increase in unbelief until they had hardened the hearts. Just like the Pharisees. The man-made teachings of the Pharisees were as pervasive as yeast in a loaf of bread. Their corruption advanced in hardly uh, pre perceptible ways, but it was extensive. Jesus denounced the Pharisees on multiple occasions. I mean, he, he did it in some very strong ways, brood of vipers. And he warned his disciples against the hypocrisy, against the yeast of the Pharisees. Jesus sought to keep his followers from a dangerous influence that would undermine faith and corrupt their walk with God. And folks, we today should heed the same warning from the Lord and guard against our own pharisaical attitudes and the temptation to take pride in man-made teachings and man-made traditions. Because once a bit of yeast is introduced into the church, it spreads quickly. Therefore, we must guard against the yeast so we can stand in freedom or we cave to the pressures of man-made traditions. So the question is, what are you going to do? question comes in, what are you going to do? How are you going to live? Are you going to live yoked to Christ, or are you going to live yoked to the law? Finally, look at uh, Galatians 5, 13 through 16 with me, if you would. You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. And here's the warning. Don't use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Now, we've talked about that through this series, but in case you haven't been here, 
you don't use your freedom to indulge the flesh. I mean, the Apostle Paul in Romans says, hey, so does that mean you go on and sin even more? Absolutely not. That's just a boneheaded thing to do, okay? Don't sit out trying to pursue sin. Don't fall into the, the desires of the flesh. Resist that. But live in a way that brings glory and honor to our Creator. Remember, we still live under the commands of God, but His are not burdensome. It's not all the other added-on stuff. It's what God gave to Moses, okay? Those Ten Commandments, we live by those things. We love our neighbors as ourselves. We read uh, Matthew 5, 6, and 7 because Jesus tells us how to flesh that out. Okay? So, and where was I? 13. Don't indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself if you bite and devour each other watch out or you will be destroyed by each other so i say walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh and i'm going to stop there for today <clears throat> paul ties us all up with this thought freedom in christ is lived out by serving others in love how then do we practically live out these words in our lives, freely serving without giving in to our sinful and selfish nature. Remember the Galatians. They were a people who, who struggled to stay committed to their new faith, easily being pulled back into old habits and ways. So they were prone to abuse the message of freedom to mean that they were not required to have any restraints in their lives. And that's a real danger. And that's why Paul addressed that in Romans, while at the same time, the Judaizers were telling them to live more rigidly. Paul corrects this erroneous thinking and reminds them what the true reason for spiritual freedom in Christ is that he died for. They are free, and here's why you are free. Here's why I am free. We are free so that we may be able to serve others in love. Not out of obligation, but in love. Paul teaches the Corinthians a similar message in 1 Corinthians 12. In this text, he explains that they all have gifts given by the Holy Spirit, but these gifts are given to serve the common good. All we've been given through the Spirit of God is not for us to hold on to for our own profit. It's for us to use to bless others. Paul is reminded the Galatians of the same principle. We are free so that we may serve others in love. Crosswalk uh, magazine article, it's online, had an article that talked about four ways to serve others in love on a daily basis. And I just want to share these with you real quick, okay? Number one, practice daily gratitude. Okay? Just practice daily gratitude. That's going to be hard for some of us. To have an attitude of gratitude. That's what we need to do. Practice daily gratitude. Psalm 118 verse 29 says, Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Be grateful for that. Share that with others. If we don't want to get bogged down in feelings of wonder when we, you know, uh, when we will get to the applause we think we deserve in our relationships, then we have to daily resolve to focus our minds on what we have to be thankful for. So a real practical thing, sometime this week, just list a few things, a couple of things that you're thankful for, and praise God for that, and, ha and develop this, this attitude of gratitude in your life. A thankful heart really is a joyful heart. So if you're finding that you're lacking joy, I mean genuine joy, that no matter what's going on, Life's not going to get you down. I mean, you're going to get down. Things are going to happen. But there's joy. There's a difference in joy and happiness. A thankful heart is a joyful heart. So if you're not joyful, maybe you don't have a thankful heart. I don't know. But we should be filled with joy. A key to serving well is serving with a grateful and a joyful heart. So ask yourself if you have that. Second, this is a big one, especially, I believe, in our culture because we are a culture that prides ourselves on busyness. But number two, commit to the Sabbath. 
Commit to the Sabbath. God pauses on the seventh day to rest. He made rest a part of his Ten Commandments. He instructs the Israelites to let their fields rest on the seventh year. Rest is something we are commanded to do throughout the Bible, yet most of us don't think of our, uh, our hurried lives as sinful ones. But if you don't have a rhythm of rest, you're not living the way God has asked you to. And it's not burdensome. It's really not. It's about living with your own perspective. It's about living within your own limits, limits that God's put upon us. You see, busyness in our culture is actually prized, isn't it? I mean, it really is. When talking to friends, we nearly brag about our huge workloads because that makes me important. The busier I am, the more important I am. We can brag about our overscheduled kids. Oh, we've got this, 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 and this, and that's not healthy. When do you get to breathe? It leads to disconnected marriages, disconnected relationships. Rhythms of rest in our lives are essential to being the ones who serve God and others with the fruit of the Spirit. Have you ever noticed tired people? You know, a room can be all full of energy, and somebody really tired comes in, they sit down, <gasps> it just sucks the life out of the room, doesn't it? <clears throat> Have your rest. Tired people, they're not patient people. You notice that? They can get irritated rather quickly. So if you're not a patient person, I'm not saying that's why, but it might have something to do with it. Take a nap today. Wake up being kind and patient. Tired people are not kind. They're too t it takes a lot of energy to be involved in relationships. And if you're tired, if you're not rested, it's hard to be kind. Tired people are not self-controlled. It takes a lot of thought to put your words together before you open your mouth and insert your foot. You know? So be rested so that you can be self-controlled in your speech, your language. Tired people aren't joyful. Most of the time, tired people are short, rude, they're in a hurry, and they're overwhelmed. If we want to be capable of serving others with love, which is what we're commanded to do, then we have to take God's commandment to take a Sabbath seriously. Worship Him. Free yourself. Don't be under the yoke. Number three, serve using your spiritual gifts. Serve using your spiritual gifts. Whatever your situation, bring what you love doing into it. Okay? I'm sure there are things many of you folks love doing. Maybe we don't have a ministry for that. But guess what? Bring what you love doing to it. If there's something you enjoy doing, maybe you enjoy leading Bible studies. Well, let us know. As soon as we get some things going, we can have that. Uh, maybe you enjoy um, prayer blankets. I don't know. Whatever it is you enjoy doing, try and bring your love into that. This isn't selfish. This is God's design. You see, when we serve others with our God-given talents, our service feels a little more like you just doing what you love and a lot less like draining yourself. So when you come to serve on a Sunday morning or one evening in the week, are you drained or are you filled? Be in areas where you're filled. Do what you enjoy doing. If you aren't sure what your talents or your passions are, then take some time to reflect on what gets you most excited in life. Ask the people who know you best, Hey, when do you notice me uh, shining the brightest or having the most energy or getting excited about something? Every, we, every year, we give you all an opportunity to go through a class uh, as a church to learn more about your spiritual gifts in a class we call Blueprint for Life. 
And in that class, we help you work through assessments to help you determine your spiritual gifts. Because we believe this. You serve where God's blessed you and gifted you. Shouldn't be draining. And then four, serve in the context of community. Our passage says to serve one another in love. The one another implies that service should happen in the context of community. We have a great opportunity coming up in the next couple of weeks. It's less than two weeks, actually, to live this out, to serve in community. We're doing a meal pack for Haiti. It's been on our advertisements. We're actually going to play something at the very end of this today. But on October 16th, okay, so write that down, okay? October 16th, you can sign up for one of two time slots. You can be here at 9 a.m. and serve to 10.30 a.m., or you can sign up at 10.30 a.m. and work till noon, or you can sign up at 9 and work till noon. That's fine, too. I'm going to do 9 to noon. That's when I'll be here. So I'd love to see you guys sign up and be here. And what we're doing is we're packing boxes with meals that are going to Haiti, to a place where people really struggle. Maybe you can't be here because of work or some other obligation on October 16th, and that's fine. We get that. But maybe you can help by giving some money to that. Our missions team has donated $5,000 from the missions budget. And then they've challenged us as a church to match that, which I believe, if I'm right, that will provide 40,000 meals to Haiti. Raise your hand. Anybody in here been to Haiti? Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I know there's some more. You can put your hands down if you did, but in Haiti... That's a place where hunger is a reality. That's a place where some people eat about every two or three days. And I would say the majority of people. I know that when I was there, a lot of the kids who went to the Christian schools there, the only meal they ate that day was what they got in school. That was it. And some of them, they wouldn't eat their meal because they would take it home to a younger sibling who had not eaten for a couple days. So 40,000 meals can go a long way. And that's something we can do as a church family. We can serve together. Be here on October 16th, and I, I will promise you that if you come with the right attitude, you'll, you'll leave more blessed than what you think you're blessing somebody else with. It is an awesome experience to serve others in love and to serve as a community. So I want to encourage you to mark that date if you haven't already. And if you can't be here, you can give to it a penny, a dollar, a dime. Maybe God's blessed you and you can give a couple of hundred dollars. I don't know. Let the Holy Spirit tell you. We need other people, and we need to serve along others. We need others pouring back into us words of love and encouragement when our tanks are starting to get empty. And folks, this is an opportunity for all of us to fill our brothers and sisters in Hades' tanks with love. Listen to Hebrews 10, 24 through 25, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, encouraging one another all and all the more as you see the day approaching. It's our job as a body of believers to be connected to one another, loving one another, spurring each other on to do good works that God has for us to do. And we do this, I believe, by being yoked to Christ, guarding against the yeast, and serving one another in love. So let me leave you with three questions to consider this week. Who are you yoked to, and what's that look like? It's not going to be on the screen. It's not in your bulletin. I hope you're writing it down because I really want you to consider this. Who are you yoked to, and what does that look like? Who are you yoked to, and what does that look like? Number two, what yeast are you guarding against? What is it in your life that's trying to impact you and work its way in and spread through not just you, but maybe your family? 
What yeast are you guarding against? And number three, how are you serving others in love? And if you didn't get those written down, we'll send an announce out this week with those three questions, okay? We'll just get those sent out to you so you can think about that. But if you would, would you stand and let me close this part of our worship in prayer? <clears throat> Father God, we come to you and we first of all just want to thank you for the love that you have for us as your children. I pray, God, that you would... Uh, Watch over us. I pray, God, that we would take seriously this challenge to be yoked to Christ and not to be yoked to some form of law kind of slavery that, that binds us up. But you have given us freedom. It is for freedom that we have been set free. And so help us to come in alongside Jesus into the yoke that he provides and let us walk in step with him. God, I pray that you would help us guard against the yeast that tries to uh, penetrate our lives. Help us to be aware, to pray watching for the things that try to attack us. And God, I pray that you will help us to have eyes that see opportunities to serve others in love. They're there. Just help us to see that and to be obedient to that. God, we pray this all in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Well, folks, this morning, we want to give you an opportunity. I said at the very beginning, my prayer is that the Holy Spirit would work on our hearts and our minds. So maybe you're here this morning, and maybe one of the very first things you need to do is to be yoked with Christ. Maybe you need to allow Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of your life, to come alongside him and not be burdened by the weight of sin, but to walk in the freedom that is Christ. Maybe that's the first thing you need to do. Maybe there are those of you here this morning who are battling. Maybe there's a yeast, there's a sin, there's a temptation that is just raging. And maybe you just want somebody to pray with you about that. Or maybe you're here this morning and you just want to find opportunities to serve. Maybe you want to love other people through your service. Listen, we're going to have our elders and staff and people on our prayer team. If you guys would, would you go ahead and start making your ways to those outside walls? That way people can identify who you are and they can come to you. And these folks, they are here not to judge. They're here for one reason, to be the body of Christ to you, to love you and to pray with you about whatever it is that may be going on in your life right now. So whether you need to be yoked with Christ or prayers against yeast or want to uh, find ways to serve, we want to invite you to come. So as we sing this next song, you're invited to go to one of them. A thousand times I fail, still your mercy remains. Should I stumble up? to 
consume me from the inside out, Lord. Let justice and praise become my embrace to love you from the inside out, everlasting. Your light will shine when all else fades, never ending. Your glory goes beyond all fame, and the cry of my heart is to bring you praise from the I think of sin and I think of regret. And the dictionary said sin is breaking a moral law. Regret is feeling sorrow. When I think of sin, I know because I know Christ. I know what he's done. And I know what God has said he'll do if I confess my sins. So they are gone. They are forgotten. But my regrets, I seem to hang on to. And it just gives Satan a foothold to use him as he will. And he does. Uh, where I do my Bible study at home, I can look out my window and I can see a beautiful purple leaf tree that we planted. And it's wonderful. I love that tree. And the summer came on. I took a large house plant out to the porch. And I sat down to do my Bible study. And that large house plant had blocked my beautiful view of that tree. And at that moment, I had an aha moment from the Holy Spirit. He said, Marie, that's exactly what you're doing to the beautiful view of the Lord with your regrets. In Luke, uh, Christ established communion. And part of it was said, remember me. As you're taking your emblems today, don't bring that blockage with you. Just enjoy your beautiful Lord as you take your communion. Heavenly Father, we just thank you that you have our life designed out, that you've established communion, that we have a table to meet with you, Lord. We just thank you for that. We thank you for your son. In Christ's name we pray, amen. We have our offering uh, boxes on the wall there. Let's pray. And Father, we just thank you also for the opportunity to give um, to this congregation, Father, and to the service and to glorify you. We ask your blessing upon our offering. 
In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Meal Pack is my favorite day of the year. When they open up those volunteer slots, they are gone instantaneously. People are excited to do it, they are energized to do it. So it's basically a time to just come and be with your friends and your family um, and do something great. We've had a lot of people that invite their friends and family who don't go to church. And so Meal Pack is like an entry point sometimes for people into church. It's a great way to have the family serve together from ages five to, I had a lady in here that was 98 and she was packing meals. It's fun to see groups and ball teams and children uh, come together to serve. And even if you don't go to church here, you can still be a part of it. And it's just a really cool opportunity to see so many people come together and make a difference in the world. It's not just meeting a physical need, but it's allowing us to have a tool to use to share the gospel with people who need it the most. Well, it's such a fun community-driven um, environment that really just kind of gets everybody energized and excited. You got a music and everybody's getting into the music and they're dancing and they're just having a good time and everyone has a specific task. And then the end result, again, is, is boxes and boxes of food. And then just having people be able to live on mission as well, I mean, it's just, you got to do it. stand and let's sing and worship with our last song.
25 says, but whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they've heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in what they do. So continue walking and step with God this week and step with his word, step with his spirit, and you will be blessed. If this is your first time with us this morning, Donnie would love to meet you and greet you, get to know you a little bit back in our hospitality room. It's just right through that door with the red wall right there. And we just hope to see you back next week. And everyone else, so good to see you, and we'll have a good week.